a long time ago, mathematicians wondered about how to calculate the slope of tangent lines. Archimedes, for example, did a lot of things with calculus, but he didn't really get down to actually finding the slope of tangent lines. He was the very first mathematician to actually do wonderful things with calculus. However, it was Newton who first began to find the slopes of tangent lines using an empirical method. Not only Newton, but also Leibniz. And what they did was they found the slope of a tangent line using finite differences, which were really just the slopes of secants not parallel to the tangent line. So, for example, <coughs> if you look at this <coughs> diagram here, the green line here is a secant line. To find the slope of this red tangent line, which we already know is minus 3, since the equation is given up here, we simply keep <coughs> moving that secant line until it really becomes parallel with the tangent line. Okay? So, <coughs> really, we're taking this difference quotient here, as you can see, this 8.83 minus 6.25 divided by 4.2 minus 0 0.5, and that difference quotient is really what ends up being the determining factor for the slope of the red tangent line. There are a lot of problems with mainstream calculus. It's flawed for several reasons as I'll explain shortly. <coughs> but one of the main reasons is that in order for this function here to be differentiable at this point here, essentially what Cauchy's or Cauchy's definition is saying is that it needs to have a derivative at every point in the short interval here. Can you see that? except possibly, perhaps, at that blue point. So, what I've done here is I've drawn a secant line over here, which is, uh, drawn a secant, a parallel tangent line, green tangent line, which is uh, parallel to this secant line here. And this pink dot here, or this pink point, is actually the abscissa of the mean value. Okay, so as I move this along here, this really gives me <coughs> f dash of c, whatever c is for this pink point, in other words, the x-coordinate. So the problem really with Cauchy's kludge is that <laughs> it uses limits, and limits are inherently flawed. Well, why are limits inherently flawed? Well, let's see. <coughs> in order to use the ill-defined limit definition, now you'll see that I have here epsilon as a function of delta. It really is a function of delta, even though mathematicians don't like to think so. Um, you could actually just say for all epsilon greater than zero, but really it's for all epsilon function of delta greater than zero. There exists a delta greater than zero over here such that for all x, the distance between x and a lies between 0 and delta, and that implies that the distance between f of x and l is less than epsilon. So now, in order to use this definition here, one must know the value of l, this l here. But guess what? This l is derived from this formula over here, right? You see that? So, and this f of x is actually this finite difference right over here. This f of x is this finite difference right over here. 
<clears throat> so one must know the value of L. However, in order to find L, one must use the ill-defined limit definition, this definition here, which is the same as this one here. Okay, you can easily transform this definition into this definition by a simple substitution. So now you see H over here, and now you don't. Well, Cauchy had stated in his course de Analyse that irrational numbers are to be regarded as limit subsequences of rational numbers. A famous historian called Carl Boyer showed that this can't possibly be true. <coughs> because, well, in order to know the limit, one has to assume that such a limit already exists. In other words, the prior definition is required for the very quantity whose definition is being attempted. And so the reason for Cauchy's clues being wrong is that it is defined as a limit. And by the very definition of limits, L here is a limit. Okay, as you see over here, L is equal to the first derivative at A. And so, this is really why the mainstream definition of derivative is flawed. In upcoming videos, I will explain to you how the new calculus solves this problem without the use of limits, infinitesimals, or the malformed concept of infinity. So I hope you'll join me again in the next video to learn more about how the mainstream calculus is flawed and also to learn about the new calculus definitions, not only for the derivative but also for the integral. Because, as you know, in mainstream calculus, the integral is also defined in terms of limits. So I hope you've enjoyed this video, and join me soon again for another video on calculus that will cover all these topics and much more. I'm John Gabriel. Take care.